connecting point. And uh, this week we're in Micah chapter 3. We're going to start at uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 and we're going to go all the way to verse 8 of chapter 4. But before we get into the text, um, here's a question that I want you to think about just to prepare us to really look at chapter 3. And that is, what do you think it means to take sin seriously? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes and then we'll come back and dive right into the text. In chapter 3 of Micah, 3 is kind of a dark chapter and Micah is um, in, he's confronting the leaders of Israel then he'll confront the prophets of Israel. Then he'll jump back and confront the leaders again. And uh, chapter 3 does not end well for Israel. And as Micah is talking about the judgment that is to come. But then we'll turn the corner into chapter 4. And, and uh, so chapter 3 is not the end of the story. So let's begin at verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Then I said, that's Micah talking, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel. Should you not embrace justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot? Then they cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. So in this text, Micah is appealing to the leaders of Israel to listen. Now you've got to keep in mind, if you remember from our introduction to the book of Micah, that there had been reforms under King Hezekiah, um, along with the prophets Isaiah and Micah, that have brought some reform and brought some religious order to the nation, and so you have this nation now kind of looking like they're religious and pious and they're trying to do the right things supposedly, but underneath the facade, this is what Micah is confronting, this evil that is evident among the leaders of the people. So Micah appeals to the leaders to listen to him. He basically accuses them of betraying and violating their responsibility to maintain justice. And uh, he says, should you not embrace justice? He comments on their character. He says, they have hearts that are evil. Then he comments on their conduct. They behave like cannibals. This is a metaphor describing the effect of evil leadership. And we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. Then he describes their delusion. They cry, they cry out to the Lord, even in their wickedness. And then in verse 4, there's the consequence. God will not answer them because of that wickedness. So describing the behavior of Israel's leaders as cannibalistic, it reflects the damage done to the people stripping them of who they are and what they have and leaving them desperate and powerless. So it's an interesting picture that Micah presents of this cannibalistic way of leadership. And uh, another prophet, Ezekiel, um, in contrast, gives this picture. Ezekiel describes the life given through the word of the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 37, 4 to 6, I think kind of a familiar verse to many. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And so th these two prophets really um, illustrate 
death and life, darkness and light, the move from just hopelessness and sinfulness to the from that to life and life with God, it really illustrates the power of the word of God to to bring life to people, whereas what Micah is describing in their leaders is they're just bringing death and destruction. And we're going to come back to those leaders in a few verses, but before we get there, Micah then turns his focus on to the prophets. And in, so in verse 5 he says, This is what the Lord says, As for the prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace, if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. So, if you provide food, this is kind of from the perspective of the prophets, if you provide food, we'll say what you want to hear. Oh yeah, you'll have peace, everything's going to be good. If you don't provide food, we'll treat you as an enemy. The principle here, and this is an important principle just in in not just for leaders and prophets, but just in daily life, the principle here is whatever motivates you is what will shape your message. So, let's go to a table talk. Is it possible to have a wrong motive for sharing the gospel or a message from God's word? What might that be? And what is the right motive? Take a few moments, think about that, talk about it, and we'll come back and we'll carry on in Micah. Okay, so Micah has made this accusation against the prophets, and then he moves into verse 6, which is God's judgment on the prophets. And he says in verse 6, Therefore, night will come over you without visions, and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets, and the day will go dark for them. Well, and So in verse 6, saying that the thing that you're designed to do isn't going to happen. You're not going to be able to prophesy. You're not going to be able to see what the Lord is showing you. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced and they will cover their faces. Why? Because there is no answer from God for them. And then what Micah does is this interesting thing after verse 6 and 7 in verse 8. He offers himself as an example of the genuine prophet. And there's things to be learned here. For, so verse 8, But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. So a few things that we learn from Micah's example is, number one, power. Where does it come from? Power is in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord. Right? Not... And, and, the, the principle we identified before is what motivates you is what will shape your message. Well, if you're motivated from within by the Spirit of the Lord, it's going to shape your message. And in this case, motiv uh, Micah's motivation is justice because he's, he's uh, addressing particular things that the leaders are doing wrong and the prophets are doing wrong. So his motivation is justice. And... The other principle here is the motivation has might, or some translations use the word courage, to speak. They have the courage to speak. To speak what? Well, the prophet will say what is true, even if it is provoking or unpopular, even if he has to confront the transgressions of Jacob or the sins of Israel. That's not going to deter him from, what doing, from doing what the Lord is guiding him to do. Now he turns his focus back to the leaders. Verse 9, Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who despise justice, so he repeats that, and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. So the things that he's accusing them of here are they despise justice, they pervert what is right. They were guilty of bloodshed and they use bribery to make their judgments. And they teach and prophesy for payment. And yet, when we go to verse to the second part of verse 11, 
Micah says, Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. So they depended on religious appearance to justify their actions. And it's interesting that Jesus encountered this same thing in Matthew chapter 23, that whole chapter. I'll just give you just a short piece of it. In verse 27 of Matthew 23, Jesus says, uh, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So it's kind of a case of the more things change, the more they stay the same. In Micah's day, there was this problem, and in Jesus' day, amongst the religious leaders, um, he encountered these same problems. Um, but before Jesus delivered what we call the seven woes to the Pharisees in, the, in chapter 23 of Matthew, before he delivers these seven woes, he gives us the kingdom principle of leadership and influence. And we need to pay attention to this. Um, in that same chapter, chapter 23, in verse, starting in verse 11 and then in 12, Jesus said this, The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. With that in mind, I'd like to go to this table talk. In Matthew 23, Jesus pointed to the godly principles of leadership and influence that were lacking both in Micah's time as well as Jesus' time. How do the principles of servanthood and humility apply to your life and to the life of the local church. So take a few minutes, and then we'll be back, and we'll pick it up at uh, verse 12. All right. Ma uh, Micah, verse 12. Uh, chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. So he's because of you, the leaders and the religious leaders of the day. Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. The very things that the leaders found their security in would be the things that would get destroyed. Their holy city, their temple, all the kind of the external things that made them look religious. They're all going to get destroyed. If you remember the story of Micah, he's living at the time Hezekiah and Assyria is on their doorstep at Jerusalem. They've Assyria's already destroyed most of the towns of Judah and they're at the gates of Jerusalem. And then we have that miraculous thing that we talked about in our introduction um, where the Lord uh, destroyed the armies of the Assyrians who were being led by Sennacherib and, and, and delivered in Jerusalem at that time because of the righteousness of Hezekiah and Isaiah and Micah. But all this was doing was um, kind of delaying the judgment. And Micah describes this judgment in verse 12 in, in that the, the Zion will be plowed like a field, will be flattened. And Jerusalem will be a heap of rubble and the temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. And we see this fulfilled 100, 100, maybe a little more than 100 years later. Um, and we can read about it in 2 Kings 25. That whole chapter um, describes Babylon, who had now uh, taken over as the superpower from Assyria. And Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar, lays siege to Jerusalem and destroys the city and the temple. I'll just read uh, verse uh, uh, 9 and 10 uh, from 2 Kings 25. It's kind of a, a summary of all that happened. It doesn't drill very deep into the details, but it says, 
he set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every important building he burned down. The whole Babylonian army under the commander of the imperial guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And of course, this was the beginning of the um, exile, where Judah was exiled to Babylon. And Jeremiah talked about how that would last 70 years. And, then, and it did. And then when that time came to an end, you can also read from the books of Ezra and Nehemiah as they go back to Jerusalem um, and they begin to rebuild and what they find. And it's especially descriptive in, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 where Nehemiah goes and he finds the city, the walls are broken, everything's a rubble. And then he appeals to the king of Persia now that can we go back and rebuild what what we once had and and, and that was the, the the political policy of Persia was to allow the people to rebuild um, what they had and to worship their own gods and so Ezra under Ezra Nehemiah and then also a fellow named Zerubbabel they went and they rebuilt but what they found there was what is described in Micah three twelve a heap of rubble a city that had just been plowed and uh, they had to, to rebuild it all over again. Then we get to chapter 4 and I'll read chapter 4 um, first or, uh, verses 1 to 8. Next week Tyler will pick it up at verse 9 um, and then, then we'll have a look at this. Uh, 4 1. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation will not take up sword against nation nor will they train for war anymore everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid for the lord almighty has spoken all the nations may walk in the name of their gods but we will walk in the name of the lord our god forever and ever in that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame my remnant. Those driven away, uh, a strong nation, the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. There is this jarring kind of, I don't know, stark contrast between the end of chapter 3 and chapter 4. Chapter 3 ends with this declaration of judgment and destruction. And Micah moves from declaring judgment and destruction to describing a vision of what he calls the last days. Uh, Old Testament Jews saw history in terms of two ages, this age and the age to come. This age references basically what we would see as Old Testament history. The age to come references when the Messiah would bring deliverance and after that. Chapter 4 verse 1 points to Jesus, the true temple being lifted up and all peoples being drawn to him. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, which is him being crucified, will draw all people to myself. The arrival of Jesus the Messiah is the event that begins the last days. In verse 2 of Micah 4, He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. And that's, that's kind of a, a 
a sentence that describes the shift that takes place. And we, right now, we live in the last days, but have not yet experienced the fullness of Micah's message. In verses 3 and 4, for instance, when he talks about um, peace between nations and, and basically that peace that he talks about. And then in verse 5, Micah speaks of the transition to eternal life. He says, when we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. In verse 5, this reference to eternity is also a reference to the last day. The last days will cum culminate in the last day. There's this interesting conversation between Jesus and Martha in John 11, starting in verse 24, and it's it's around her, uh, around uh, Lazarus who had died, and 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 uh, Jesus comes back, and you remember the story. Jesus will call Lazarus out of his tomb, but in, in before that, John 11:24, it says Martha answered, "I know he will rise again." in the resurrection of the last day. And then Jesus responds to her this way, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? But, but Martha correctly references this time called the last day. And the last day will be the time of the completely restored kingdom with the Lamb who is also the shepherd. The one sacrificed is also the king. Revelation chapter 7 verse 17 says it this way, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So, referencing back to Micah, Micah's move from hopelessness to hope between chapter 3 and then into 4, from judgment to salvation, or Good Friday to Resurrection Sunday as we anticipate Easter celebrations later this month. This is the message of the Gospel. So, to end off today, our table talk is this. Where are you in this process of moving from hopelessness to hope? And how does understanding the last day help you?